Hello. This is the continuation of my video on the expansion of Russia in East Asia from 1895 to 1904. I had just finished describing the European acquisitions of Chinese territory in 1897-98 and the building of a Russian railway to their new naval base at Port Arthur. For the Japanese, these successive Western interventions in China provided an illuminating example of the use of force and the threat of force by the great powers to make gains over weak countries. More generally, the hypocrisy of the Americans, for example, in claiming to liberate Cuba from Spanish tyranny whilst themselves seizing the Philippines as a colony, also in 1898, drew Japanese comment. But it was the Russians who were seen in the worst light. First they had taken the lead in preventing Japan from taking what its leaders saw as the rightful spoils of war when they had forced the Japanese out of Port Arthur and the Liaodong Peninsula at the end of the Sino-Japanese War. But then, only two years later, they had taken the area for themselves by the threat of force. These Russian gains were also an unwelcome development for the British, who feared that Russian dominance in Manchuria would not only exclude British economic interests, but more importantly give the Russians the potential to dominate Beijing, and hence northern China, and so make the Chinese government its vassal, and thereby threaten British interests in central and southern China as well. A joint Russo-British agreement in April 1899 addressed these concerns, demarcating respective spheres of influence, recognizing British dominance in the Yangtze Valley and Russian interests north of the Great Wall. Tensions between the great powers were interrupted in 1900 by the Boxer uprising in China and the resultant siege of the foreign legations in Beijing. This led to the intervention of an eight-nation alliance in which troops from the various European powers combined with those of the United States and Japan to relieve the legations, the Russians supplying the second largest contingent of troops after the Japanese. Coinciding with the intervention in Beijing was a massive Russian invasion of Manchuria with some 100,000 men or more. This was completely separate from the relief of the legations and involved only Russian troops. After fierce fighting, the Russians overwhelmed the Manchu bannermen, who were their primary opponents, and successfully occupied the province. Guerrilla warfare by those whom the Russians termed bandits continued afterwards, the Russians responding harshly, burning down villages and killing civilians. Russia's intentions to create a permanent colony in Manchuria were made clear when it did not evacuate its troops from the area after the Boxer Protocol between China and the foreign powers had been signed in 1901, ending the Allied intervention. With support for China from Japan and Britain, diplomatic pressure was exerted to encourage the Russians to comply, but the response was only partial, troops being kept in place to guard the Russian railways and other facilities, but withdrawing from the hinterland. At this point, the Japanese sought to negotiate with the Russians. If the Russians had already agreed to spheres of influence to avoid potential conflict with the British, then surely a similar arrangement could be worked out with Japan. The Japanese were prepared to accept a de facto Russian control of Manchuria if, in exchange, the Russians were prepared to accept Japan exercising a similar dominance over Korea. The Russians proved intransigent, however. For many in the ruling Russian elite, Japanese control of Korea was perceived as a threat. If Japan controlled Korea, then it also controlled the narrow Korean Strait between the Japanese islands and the Asian mainland, and thus the southern approaches to Vladivostok, as well as the sea route between Vladivostok and Port Arthur. Of course, for the Japanese, Russian control of Korea was totally unacceptable, as it would directly menace the Japanese home islands. Out of this impasse, the Japanese moved towards alliance with Britain, a relationship formalized in January 1902. Significantly, the British explicitly recognized Japan's special interests in Korea. See my video on East Asia 1895-1902 for more details of this. 
The Japanese continued to seek some compromise with the Russians, but the Russians continued to prevaricate. The dismissal of the moderate, Sergei Witt, from the Russian government in August 1903 was taken as a sign of increasing intransigence. Bolstered by their alliance with the British, however, the Japanese also began to plan for war. Finally, in the face of continuing frustration, the Japanese attacked in February 1904, the resultant Russo-Japanese War marking one of the major turning points, not just in East Asian history, but in the history of the world. I will discuss that war in another video. Thank you for listening. For other videos in this series on Russian expansion and on the Trans-Siberian Railway and general developments in East Asia in this period, see my YouTube channel.